Hello, welcome back to Biology with Risa. This is part two of a five-part lecture series on the male and female reproductive system. In this video, I will be focusing on the male and female reproductive anatomy. Let's start by talking about the male reproductive system. We'll start by talking about the testes and the scrotum. Then we'll talk about how sperm is transported throughout the male reproductive system. We'll talk about the glands that contribute to the fluid in the semen. And then we'll talk a little bit about the structure of the penis itself. The testes are the site of sperm and testosterone production. They are covered by a white fibrous capsule called a tunica albuginea. I always remember this word because tunic means covering and albuginea, the prefix means white, like albino. So it's a white covering surrounding the testes. The tunica albuginea is covered by a double layer membrane called the tunica vaginalis. So it has two layers. The inner layer that comes in contact with the testes is called the visceral tunica vaginalis. Visceral means related to the organs, so it actually comes in contact with the organs. The outer layer that you see here is called the parietal tunica vaginalis. And parietal means surrounding, so that's the outer layer of the membrane. One interesting thing about the tunica vaginalis is that it actually is derived from the peritoneum, which is the membranous covering surrounding your abdominal cavity. So here you can actually see in an eight month old fetus, the peritoneum extends down towards where the testes would be. And then it eventually pinches off so that it forms its own little covering around the testes. The scrotum is a pouch of skin, muscles, and connective tissue surrounding the testes. They're important because they allow the testes to hang outside the body to keep the sperm cool. The ideal temperature for sperm production is 35 degrees Celsius, whereas our body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius. So by allowing the testes to hang outside the body, it keeps them cooler than our core body temperature. Males actually have a couple of characteristics to allow them to regulate the temperature of their testes. First off, there are a couple muscles associated with the testes called the dartus and cremaster muscles. And you can see them here. Here's the cremaster muscles and here's the dartus muscles outside of that. These muscles surround the testes and they support the scrotum from above and they actually contract to pull the testes closer to the body when it's cold. And then they can relax to let the testes hang farther from the body whenever it's warm. So it's one way to regulate the temperature of the testes themselves. Also, males have a network of veins called the papiniform plexus that actually cool the blood before it reaches the testes. And that helps to, again, keep the testes cool to optimize sperm production. Here you can actually see some of the features we talked about, like the cremaster muscles. Here's the scrotum, which is the skin surrounding the testes. And one other thing I want to point out is that a lot of times the left testis actually extends lower, so it's suspended lower than the right, and this actually prevents them from being compressed against each other. One clinical application associated with the testes is undescended testes. 3% of boys are actually born with undescended testicles. Undescended testes may increase the risk of infertility and testicular cancer. So a lot of times certain procedures will be done to actually pull the testes down. So here you can see an undescended testicle, whereas it should fall down into the scrotum like this. So what do they do if a uh, child is born with undescended testes, one thing that they usually do is actually nothing. Um, usually it will descend on its own within six months, so they might just actually wait to see if it will fall down on its own. Um, another thing that may be done though is hormone injections or surgery um, may be needed to actually pull the, the undescended testicle down into the scrotal sac. Now let's look within the testicles to look at the structures that are actually involved in sperm production. Within the testicles, there is a collection of tubes called the seminiferous tubules. Within these tubes is where sperm is produced. So let's look at a cross section of a seminiferous tubule. In the periphery of the tubule, you see what are called germ cells or spermatogonia. 
germ cells is a general term for any cells that will eventually become gametes. So these spermatogonia undergo cell division and become specialized as sperm. And as they undergo development, the developing sperm move closer and closer to the lumen or center of the seminiferous tubules. So here you can actually see a spermatid. This is a cell that is almost a complete sperm. It still doesn't have a tail yet though. And then once it grows its tail, you can see them in the middle here um, concentrated in this area. Another cell that you see within the seminiferous tubules, which we'll talk about more later, are the sustentacular cells or Sertoli cells. Sustentacular means supporting. So these are supporting cells. They actually support the developing sperm. Again, within the testes, we have these seminiferous tubules. These are the tubes where the sperm is actually produced from germ cells called spermatogonia. And as I was saying before, there are two types of cells within the seminiferous tubule. You have the developing sperm cells and you have the sustenticular or Sertoli cells. These cells have several functions and they are found surrounding the developing sperm inside here. One, they nourish and protect the developing sperm. These cells also release the hormone inhibin when sperm counts are high. So this hormone inhibin inhibits FSH secretion from the anterior pituitary and this reduces uh, sperm production. Another important role of the sustentacular cells is that they form tight junctions around the sperm. And this actually prevents blood from coming in contact with the sperm and creates a blood testes barrier, which is important in order to protect the sperm. Now, if we look outside of the seminiferous tubules, we actually see another collection of cells. So this is a scanning electron image. So here you can see a seminiferous tubule. Here you can see the tails of many sperm that are developing inside the tubules. Here too, you can see a seminiferous tubule. On the outside, we have these cells called interstitial or Leydig cells. And you can see them here as well. These are endocrine cells and they produce testosterone. One point I wanna make about the movement of sperm and a misconception that some people have is that a lot of people think sperm swim through the male reproductive system. However, sperm do not swim in the male reproductive tract because it's too acidic. Only once they're inside the female reproductive tract and have been mixed with the semen are they capable of swimming because the semen help to create an alkaline or basic environment. In males, the sperm are capable of moving through the different ducts because of smooth muscle contractions and cilia that are present in the ducts that kind of push the sperm along. So let's look at the path that sperm follow from the seminiferous tubules to outside of the body. So sperm are gonna develop in the seminiferous tubules. Once they have developed and they have grown a tail, they will move into the reet testes, which is this network of tubes within the testicles. And then they will leave the testicles through what are called the efferent duct ductules. Once they move out of the testes, they will end up in what's called the epididymis. They will spend a couple days in the epididymis because this is where they will actually mature. So even though they already have a tail, they are not capable of swimming. Even if they were ejaculated, they could not swim at this point. So it takes a couple of days for them to actually mature within the epididymis before they can be ejaculated. So until ejaculation happens, they, they're stored within the epididymis. And then whenever ejaculation happens, the sperm will move through the ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens. And you can see that here as well. So here is the testicles, here's the epididymis, which surrounds the testicles. And then here is the ductus deferens, right there. The ductus deferens joins with what's called the ejaculatory duct. Once in the ejaculatory duct, some fluid is added from this structure right here, which is the seminal vesicle. So this gland right here is contributing to some of the fluid in the semen. This structure that you see here is the prostate gland. So you can see the ejaculatory duct goes through the prostate gland. The prostate gland will also add fluid 
to the sperm to create the semen. The ejaculatory duct comes in contact with the urethra and the urethra transports the sperm outside of the body. So again, let's follow this path one more time. Within the testes, we have the seminiferous tubules. This is the site of sperm formation. They have tails, but they're not motile yet. They cannot swim until they fully mature. Within the testes, there's a meshwork of channels or ducts that collect the sperm from the seminiferous tubules. This is called the reed testes. And then the sperm exit the testes through the efferent ductules or efferent ductules. This carries the sperm out of the testes to the epididymis, which you can see here. The epididymis, again, stores the sperm until they mature. Um, it takes about 20 days for them to become motile. And if they're not ejaculated within 40 to 60 days, the sperm just simply degenerate on, and are resorbed by the body and the body will replace them with new, fresher sperm. When ejaculation happens, that's whenever the sperm will move through the ductus or vas deferens. Now, not all the sperm in the epididymis will move out, only those that are mature and probably the ones that are closest to the vas deferens will be ejaculated. So during ejaculation, the sperm move through the ductus or vas deferens. And you can see that there's a, one on either side. And then they move through the ejaculatory duct, which you can see right here and here. The ejaculatory duct is formed by the joining of the ductus or vas deferens and a small little duct from the seminal vesicles. And again, seminal fluid is added from the seminal vesicles to contribute to the semen. The ejaculatory duct then transports the sperm to the urethra and the urethra passes through the prostate gland and then out through the penis. So let's see if you can trace the flow of sperm from the seminiferous tubules to the urethral orifice. So after the seminiferous tubules, try without looking to think about what's next. The sperm will enter the reet testes. Then it will enter the efferent ductules and that's how it leaves the testes. It will then mature in the epididymis and it will stay there until ejaculation. During ejaculation, it will move through the ductus or vas deferens. Then that connects to the ejaculatory duct where seminal vesicle fluid is added. And then it will move out through the urethra right here. And again, the prostate gland contributes fluid to the semen as well. And there's another gland also that empties into the urethra, which we'll talk about later. This is the bulbo-urethral gland, and it's more going to release a lubricant before ejaculation happens. But either way, the sperm then move out through the urethral orifice. Now let's look at the accessory glands that contribute to semen production. Semen is the fluid expelled during orgasm. And usually during one ejaculation, there's about three to five milliliters of semen that is expelled and semen is really important um, because it is alkaline and it neutralizes the acidity of the vagina so the vagina is pretty acidic environment with a ph of about 3.5 but the semen itself bring down the acidity to about 7.5 so it becomes a little basic the sperm need a higher ph again to activate swimming Second, the semen contains a lot of nutrients that help to support the traveling sperm. And because of this, sperm can actually survive three to five days within the uterus. So it is possible that three to five days after intercourse um, that fertilization happens. Semen contains fluid from the testicles itself. So about 10% of the fluid in the semen comes from the testicles and from the sperm itself. Every milliliter of semen usually has anywhere between 50 to 120 million sperm within it. Also contributing to the semen is fluid from the seminal vesicles, which is about 65% of the fluid. And then 25% of the fluid comes from the prostate gland. And then you just have trace amounts of fluid from the bulbo urethral glands. So now let's look at what type 
of substances are contributed to the semen from each one of these glands. The seminal vesicles, again, are paired glands. They're posterior to the bladder and they empty their fluid into the ejaculatory duct here. One thing that this fluid contains is nutrients such as fructose for the sperm. It also contains chemicals that promote widening of the cervix and promotes contraction of the uterus. And this may actually help with sperm transfer once the sperm enter the uterus. The prostate gland surrounds the urethra. And you can see that here, this is the prostate gland. And it also surrounds some of the ejaculatory duct. It contributes certain chemicals to the semen that help to regulate its thickness. The last gland that we're gonna look at is the bulbourethral or Cowper's gland. This is located at the inner end of the penis and it empties its fluid into the urethra. This fluid that's contributed by the bulbourethral gland is also known as the pre-ejaculate because it lubricates the head of the penis prior to intercourse. It may also have a role in cleaning urine residue from the urethra itself because the urethra provides passageway for the urine as well as the semen. One question that I get from students a lot is, does the pre-ejaculate contain viable sperm? And one study that I found here, which I will put a link to below, they looked at several samples of pre-ejaculate and they found that 37% of the samples actually contain motile sperm. Here is a cadaver image and you can see in the first image, the seminal vesicle is highlighted. And this is the bladder here, and this is the urethra. Here you can see the prostate gland on the right image, and you can see that the urethra runs through the prostate gland. Because the prostate surrounds the urethra, it can be really problematic whenever the prostate starts to enlarge. And this is very common in older men. After age 45, the prostate normally begins to grow slowly. And by age 70, 90% of men show some degree of non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. And this is known as BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. So here you can actually see the normal prostate. And this is what it may look like if it begins to become enlarged. And when it begins to become enlarged, it begins to compress the urethra, which makes it harder to urinate. And because of this, it increases the chance of kidney or bladder infections. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men over 50. It is a slow growing cancer and has an 80% survival rate if detected early. And this is why it is highly recommended for men over 50 to go for constant prostate screenings. Prostate cancer can be diagnosed by rectal palpation. So the doctor will actually fill up the rectum. And if the prostate is enlarged, they'll be able to detect that because the prostate will enlarge to the point where it will kind of push into the rectal area. Also, doctors can do blood tests to look at levels of specific enzymes which are secreted by the prostate to detect the likelihood that somebody has prostate cancer. So now let's look at the structures within the penis itself. But before we do that, I have a little fun fact for you. What animal has the longest penis to body size ratio in the animal kingdom? So what do you think is the answer to this question? It might surprise you. A lot of people will say whale or something like that, but it is actually a barnacle. Barnacles are a type of crustacean, and you might see these actually like stuck to rocks when you go to the beach. They actually have the longest penis to body size ratio in the animal kingdom with a ratio of 40 to one. And this is because they are sessile, they can't move. So in order to inseminate other individuals, they have to be able to extend their penis out so they can actually fertilize other individuals here. So here's a little video showing this. So here you can see the penis from one individual and they'll just kind of move it around and inseminate other individuals in the colony around them. So now you can test your friends and see if anybody can guess that barnacles have the longest penis to body size ratio in the animal kingdom. Now let's look at the anatomy of the human penis. 
the penis functions in depositing semen into the vagina. Half of it is internal and is called the root, and half of it is external and is called the shaft. If we look at the tip of the penis, you can see surrounding the urethral orifice is the gland's penis. And this is the end of the penis. It contains a high concentration of nerve endings. Surrounding that is a flap of tissue or skin called the prepuce, also commonly called the foreskin. This also contains a high concentration of nerve endings. One of the functions of the prepuce is to lubricate and protect the gland's penis. This prepuce or foreskin is the part of the penis that is removed during circumcision. Circumcision is a surgical removal of the prepuce or foreskin of the penis. So what they'll do is they'll pull the foreskin out, then they'll cut around the rim of it, and then they'll stitch it along the bottom here. One of the reasons that this is typically done is for religious reasons. There also might be some health benefits, like it may reduce the risk of infection because it's easier to keep the tip of the penis clean without the foreskin present. However, there are some drawbacks to this procedure. First, it's performed on infants without the consent of the individual because, of course, you can't get the consent of the infant before you do this. Um, it can be painful as the anesthetics wear off. And... In addition, it may reduce sexual pleasure because the prepuce is considered one of the most sensitive parts of the penis and you're actually removing that part. Let's talk a little bit about the internal anatomy of the penis. So the internal anatomy contains some erectile bodies that actually fill with blood during arousal and allows the penis to become erect. And we have two erectile bodies within the penis. We have the corpus cavernosa, this is a, these are paired structures located dorsolaterally. So here's the urethra, and here you can see the corpus cavernosa right here and here. So it's paired structures, and you can see there's an artery running through them. And then surrounding the urethra itself is another erectile body called the corpus spongiosum. Here is another view of this. So on the top of the penis here is a corpus cavernosum. And then surrounding the urethra is the corpus spongiosum. When the penis becomes erect, these erectile bodies fill with blood, and that is what allows the penis to harden. Now let's talk about the female reproductive system. First, I'll provide an introduction about the female reproductive system. Then I'll talk about the ovaries, uterus, vagina, external genitalia, and I'll briefly mention the anatomy of the breasts. So the functions of the female reproductive system are a lot broader than what we see in males. Females must produce the female gamete, also known as the egg, ovum, or secondary oocyte, and they must deliver this gamete to the uterus. Furthermore, the uterus must provide nutrition and a safe place for fetal development, and the female reproductive system must give birth and then after birth, nourish the infant. So the female reproductive system has a lot more roles than the male reproductive system has. The internal genitalia that are important in the female reproductive system include the ovaries, which again are the primary sex organs because they produce the gametes. We also have the uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes or oviducts, the uterus, and the vagina. External genitalia that we'll talk about include the clitoris, labia minora, and labia majora. So let's look at the ovaries. These are paired structures that produce oocytes or egg cells, and they also produce female sex hormones. And you can see them here and here on either side of the uterus. This is a side view, and you can see one of the ovaries right here. Just like the testes, the ovaries are surrounded by a white fibrous capsule called the tunica albuginea. The ovaries make the egg cells, but one interesting thing about them is that they're not really physically connected to the uterus. So when the eggs are made in the ovaries, they actually have to be transported into the uterus here through these like the arms coming out of the uterus. Um, the only way that they are attached to the uterus is actually from various ligaments. And you can see one of the ligaments here. So there are several ligaments that hold the ovaries in place. We have the ovarian ligaments. They attach the ovaries to the uterus itself. 
So you can see that right here and here. Also, there are these suspensory ligaments that attach the ovaries to the walls of the pelvis to hold them in place. And then we have this large ligament called the broad ligament here, which is almost like a sheet. And it encloses the ovaries, the uterine tubes here, as well as the uterus, and it attaches to sides and the floor of the pel pelvic cavity. The uterus itself also has several ligaments that help hold it in place, and we're not gonna actually talk about those in much detail. Within the ovaries themselves, there are these balls or spheres of cells called ovarian follicles. Each one of these balls of cells contains one developing oocyte or egg. These eggs are released one at a time by bursting of a mature follicle. And whenever an egg is released from the ovaries, it's called ovulation. The follicle cells also are really important in creating a blood ovary barrier similar to the sustentacular cells of the testes. So they're actually protecting the developing egg within the inside here. So this is the oocyte or the egg, and these are the follicle cells. As they mature, the follicles grow larger and larger and larger, and the oocyte within it grows larger and larger and larger as well. Once an egg is ovulated from the ovaries, it must travel to the uterus via the uterine tubes, which are also called fallopian tubes or oviducts. The oocyte travels towards the uterus because of smooth muscle contractions and also little cilia or little like hair-like structures within the uterine tubes. One thing I want to point out now, but I'll talk about also in the next chapter um, when we look at development, is that fertilization actually happens within the uterine tubes. It actually happens at the distal end of the uterine tube, so around this area here. The sperm will have to swim all the way up through the uterus, down the uterine tube, and then fertilize the egg down in this region. However, implantation will happen within the uterus. So how does the eggs actually get from the ovaries into the uterine tubes? Well, at the end of the uterine tubes are these finger-like projections called fimbriae. And these fimbriae will actually envelop the ovaries during ovulation. So imagine this is the ovaries. The egg is being ovulated, and so it's going to leave the ovaries. And the fimbriae will actually surround the ovaries so that the egg can then move down the uterine tube. If the egg becomes fertilized down here, then it will make its way down to the uterus. The uterus is a very thick muscular chamber. It forms the roof of the vagina. So here is the vaginal canal right here. This is the bottom of the uterus. It usually, the uterus will tilt over the bladder. So here is showing a side view of the uterus. Here's the vagina again. Here is the bladder and the urethra right here. The functions of the uterus is to harbor, nourish, and expel the fetus. And the bottom of the uterus right here is called the cervix. So this is the inferior end of the uterus and it opens up to the vagina. One clinical application associated with the cervix is pap smears and cervical cancers. Pap smears are procedures where cells are scraped from the cervix and are examined for abnormalities and cancerous traits. The way this is done is a speculum is inserted into the vaginal canal and then a swab is used to remove some of the cells from the cervix. Then these cells are analyzed to see if they have any cancerous traits. It's really important to have routine pap smears because cervical cancer is one of the most common cancers of the female reproductive tract. It's usually caused by human papillomavirus or HPV infection. And about 90% of cervical cancer cases have been associated with HPV. And this is why it is recommended now that young adults receive HPV vaccinations that can prevent HPV infection and lower their risk of cervical cancer. So these are normal cells of the cervix shown here. And whenever they become malignant or cancerous, you can see that the nucleus starts to enlarge, their shape becomes abnormal and so forth. Now let's look a little bit more at the wall of the uterus. The wall of the uterus 
actually has three layers to it. The outer really thin layer of connective tissue out here is called the perimetrium. Remember, peri means surrounding. And then we have this really thick middle layer here called the myometrium. Myo means muscle. And this really thick layer here contains a whole bunch of smooth muscles. And this is important because it helps to produce labor contractions to expel the fetus. And then the innermost layer right here is called the endometrium. Endo means within or inside. This is a highly vascular rise layer. So it has a lot of blood supply. And this is really important because the fertilized egg will implant within the endometrium and this provides um, nourishment for the developing embryo. Now let's look a little bit more at the two layers of the endometrium. So here's the endometrium right here. This is the inner layer of the uterus. And then here's the myometrium out here in the middle. And so the layer of the uterus that's closest to the lumen or the space within the uterus is called the functional layer. Two important things that you need to know about this layer is that this is the layer that's actually shed during menstruation. And also this is the site where implantation of the embryo occurs. After the embryo implants itself, the placenta starts to form and the functional layer will make up the maternal part of the placenta. So the placenta is actually half maternal tissue and half fetal tissue. And I'll talk about that more when we talk about development in the next chapter. The basal layer here, or the basal layer of the endometrium is a permanent layer below the functional layer. And it helps to regenerate the functional layer after menstruation. We're not gonna go into a whole lot of detail about the blood supply to the uterus, but what I want you to know is that there's a very rich blood supply to the uterus, providing a lot of oxygen. And that's going to be extremely important because this blood supply is going to have to nourish the developing fetus. And embedded within the endometrium itself are these spiral arteries that are providing a lot of blood supply. One clinical application associated with the uterus that you should know about is called endometriosis. This is when some of the endometrial tissue actually escapes the uterus and starts to grow on the abdominal cavity and outside of the uterus itself. So there's a lot of complications associated with this, including a lot of pain, sometimes internal bleeding, because this endometrial layer that's growing out here cannot be expelled from the body during menstruation. We don't really know the causes for endometriosis, However, there are a lot of complications associated. It can actually make it a little bit difficult, more difficult to get pregnant um, when you suffer from endometriosis. Another clinical application associated with the uterus that you should know is something called an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic, this word means outside of the normal area. So an ectopic pregnancy is when the fertilized oocyte or fertilized egg implants in a location other than the uterine inner lining. This happens in about one in 300 pregnancies and usually leads to a miscarriage. Um, one of the most common places for an ectopic pregnancy is actually within the uterine tube itself. So remember, fertilization happens out here, but instead of the fertilized egg making it all the way to the uterus, it actually may implant in the fallopian tubes or uterine tubes. Uh, this is known as a tubal pregnancy. And the fetus can't survive more than eight weeks in the uterine tube because the uterine tube doesn't expand like the uterus does. So this will lead to either a miscarriage or this may lead to a therapeutic abortion because it's necessary to remove the embryo because if the embryo continues to grow there, it can actually cause hemorrhaging in the mother. Another place where the embryo could implant that is not good is actually within the cervical canal itself. The cervix can expand like the uterus can as, again, so this will not be a viable offspring. And then there are some really rare cases of abdominal pregnancies. And this is when the fertilized egg somehow escapes from the uterus completely and it implants in the abdominal cavity outside of the uterus. Um, usually this will require, again, a therapeutic abortion because it's not safe for the mother or the infant in this case. 
However, there are cases where it goes unnoticed, and in 9% of cases, it results in a live birth via cesarean section. One interesting thing is that the embryo can implant pretty much anywhere where there's sufficient blood supply. Now let's look at the vagina. The vagina is a muscular tube that leads to the cervix. It contains circular ridges surrounding it, and it functions as the birth canal, the copulatory organ, and also a passageway for menstruation. Now let's look at the female external genitalia, collectively called the vulva. The thick outer folds that you see here and here are called the labia majora, and the thinner inner folds here and here are called the labia minora. These surround a region called the vestibule, and this is the area that contains the urethral and vaginal orifice or openings. Also, not pictured here, but which are internal, are the vestibular glands that secrete a lubricant to keep the vulva lubricated during sexual intercourse. One other structure that's important in the external genitalia is the clitoris, and this is actually erectile tissue located at the anterior end of the vulva. It also is surrounded by a prepuce or foreskin similar to the penis, and most of the clitoris is actually internal and only the head of it is exposed to the outside. Again, remember the clitoris has a similar embryonic origin as the penis, and just like the penis, it functions in sensory and sexual stimulation. Here is a side view of the female reproductive system. Here you see the uterus, the ovaries, the uterine tubes or fallopian tubes, and the fimbri, those little finger-like projections. Here is the cervix and the vaginal canal. We have the labia minora and the labia majora, and here you can see the clitoris. Again, only the tip of it is sticking out. Most of it is internal. And then you can see a little prepuce or foreskin right there. This is another view of the clitoris and you can see other internal structures associated with it, as well as the vestibular glands, which secrete a lubricant during intercourse. Now let's talk briefly about the anatomy of the breast. These are mounds of tissues overlying the pectoral muscles. Non-lactating breasts are mostly composed of adipose or fat tissue and collagenous tissue. However, whenever a female begins to lactate or prepares for lactation, the breasts become enlarged and they fill with mammary glands. And these kind of look like little grape clusters here. And the function of the mammary glands, of course, is to produce milk. Surrounding the nipples is this darker region called the areola. This region contains some glands that actually secrete some types of lubricant to, that may help to prevent chapping and cracking during nursing. Also, the areola tends to darken during pregnancy to actually provide kind of like a bullseye so that the infant can orient itself towards the breast for breastfeeding. All right, so we have finished talking about the important structures that are part of the male and female reproductive system. Now I want to briefly talk about some of the hormones that regulate puberty in both males and females. So puberty is a stage of development at which individuals become sexually mature. And this is of course is controlled by hormones and these hormones are similar in both boys and girls. And the hormones that regulate puberty are released First, from the hypothalamus, we have this hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Gonadotropins are hormones that affect the gonads. So the gonadotropin-releasing hormone secreted by the hypothalamus will bind to receptors in the anterior pituitary of the brain. This causes the anterior pituitary to release two hormones that will affect the ovaries or the testes. These two hormones are called FSH and LH, follicular stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormones. These hormones bind to receptors in the ovaries and testes and cause the ovaries or testes to increase their production of estrogens and progesterones in the case of the ovaries. And in the case of the testes, it will cause an increase in the secretion of testosterone. These sex hormones signal maturation of the reproductive system and the development of secondary sex characteristics. Remember, these are 
characteristics that develop after puberty, such as in females, in large breast. In males, it would be an increase in muscular physique, lower voice, and so forth. In addition, these sex hormones increase follicle maturation in females in the ovaries, and in males, it will increase the production of sperm. One of the reasons that boys and girls start going through puberty once they reach a certain age is that the amount of these hormones begin to increase and the ovaries and testes become more sensitive to FSH and LH. So this could be because they, um, the ovaries and testes develop more receptors for these hormones as well. In addition, negative feedback is more sensitive when you're younger. So that means like testosterone and estrogen and so forth will, when you're really young, it will negatively feedback and inhibit and the release of hormones from the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. However, as you get older, this negative feedback isn't as strong, and so your levels of these hormones will start to increase. One other term that I want you to be familiar with is this term menarche, which is the first occurrence of menstruation in girls. This can be affected by a lot of different factors, including um, nutrition, the amount of stored fat, genetics, environment, and psychological stress. One really interesting thing is that in the 1860s, the average age of menarche for girls was 17, but this age continues to get lower and lower. Now the average age for a girl to have her first period is at 12.75 years old, and there are some cases where some girls start going through puberty at the age of seven. We actually don't know why the age keeps getting younger and younger for girls to start going through puberty, and it could be due to environmental factors, and it could also be due to a change in nutrition um, that's different now than in the past. One other thing I just want to mention briefly is that puberty in males tends to begin at around age 11 or 12. All right, so that is the end of part two of the reproduction lecture series. To learn more about reproduction, watch part three, which will look at gametogenesis or the formation of sperm and eggs.